I'm Laura Jimmy, Chief of Staff at the ARCV Group. The ARCV Group is the cannabis and hemp industry's first capital ecosystem. Our investor network has deployed hundreds of millions into cannabis and hemp startups. We also tout a FINRA registered broker dealer, crowdfunding platform, venture fund, and management consulting service. Thank you for joining us here today and welcome to another edition of our town hall programming where we take an in-depth look at state-by-state -state legalization. Today we are going to discuss the regulations around legalized cannabis in Oklahoma with a few guest speakers who have their finger on the pulse of this fascinating state. As many of you may know, medical marijuana was legalized in Oklahoma in 2018 with the approval of Oklahoma State Question 788. Three petitions were underway to put an adult use measure on the ballot of Oklahoma in 2020, which were met with COVID impacted delays. Nevertheless, 2021 has seen some exciting changes for Oklahoma, and we'd like to bring on our guest speakers to give you, our audience members, some insights around the current landscape. With that, I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's discussion, Sarah Falvo, Director of Community at ArcView to the virtual stage. As a reminder, after our town hall, we'll be jumping over to a breakout session to answer more questions and get to know you better. The breakout session will be in a different Zoom room and we'll share a link at the end of the town hall. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Laura, and welcome everyone. We are so excited to have this deep dive on Oklahoma today. You know, a lot has happened in the last year and good things, bad things, and everything in between. So we're going to talk really about Oklahoma today, what they've done right, the lessons they've learned. So I'd love to welcome all of our speakers to the stage today and have you turn on your cameras. So we would like to welcome Marco Glissick, Certified Public Accountant with Green Growth CPAs, Bud Scott, Executive Director of the Oklahoma Cannabis Industry Association, Cambry White, Cannabis Attorney at Climb Collective, Blake Johnson, Founder and Consultant at Climb Collective, Lisa Pittman, Partner at Zuber Lawler, Wesley Holloway, Co-Founder and Managing Member, WHTC Holdings, Travis Steffen, CEO of Growflow, Mike Irvin, Founder and CEO of Oklahoma Pure, Aaron Ray, Managing Director of Pro Clinical, and Brandy Frisbee, General Manager of Natural Remedies MMJ. Welcome everyone. So just for a little background, um, we have been sourcing questions over the last month from people um, out there. So this is a collection of some that were um, repeated a number of times. So we'd love to kick it off with a question from Mariah Shaw. Let's go ahead with that one. Hi, I'm Mariah Shaw, and I work in public affairs at Good Chemistry, which is based in Colorado, but I'm originally from Oklahoma, and so I was wondering what is going well and what maybe could use some improvement in terms of Oklahoma's regulations. Great, and let's have Blake kick this off. Go ahead, Blake. Let's start with that. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I think probably what most folks have seen uh, to the extent they're paying attention to coverage of the Oklahoma cannabis industry <laughs> have been some of the growing pains uh, that we've experienced in terms of sort of developing, rolling out, implementing and enforcing um, a lot of kind of the regulatory apparatuses that, that surround the industry, uh, you know, perhaps most notably, um, we've been operating for a couple of years now without a really robust uh, inventory tracking system. Um, I think most of our retailers would say that that's uh, led to, we've, we've seen a lot of product on the shelves that was probably imported from other markets. Uh, that's obviously put downward pressure on wholesale prices. And so the industry's felt a little bit of an economic impact from that. Um, most recently, we've, we've heard about the announcement, uh, the rollout of the of, of metric seed to sale tracking. Uh, that's been delayed due to some uh, kind of clumsy implementation on uh, our agency's part. Um, but if, if I were to, to say that there's something that the agency should be given real credit for, it's that, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, Oklahoma passed state question 788 on June 26th of 2018. Um, 30 days later, we had stood up a regulatory agency for the purpose of licensing and registration and compliance. And 30 days after that, we were accepting applications which had to be reviewed and approved or denied within 14 days from submission. 
So, you know, in a matter of just a couple months, uh, we really stood up the uh, licensing aspect, at least of this industry. And that's led to really robust medical marijuana patient community and, um, and business industry. So we enrolled more patients in the first year of our program than uh, as the percentage of our population than California has in the history of its own. Um, so I think that certainly our regulators and, uh, and department heads deserve some credit for uh, just how demanding that uh, launch period was and how effectively it was, it was managed. That's fantastic. And I'd love, Bud, for you to weigh in on this, too. You have, you're have you deep in this, so please, please add on to this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Blake. Just to piggyback on what he stated, really, what we see in Oklahoma is that the legislative session in Oklahoma runs from the beginning of February to the end of May each year. And unfortunately, what that has meant is every time the OMMA, our regulatory agency, is undergoing a rulemaking process that that entire period oftentimes overlaps or is responsive to what has occurred during the legislative session. So there's kind of this constant process of back and forth between what's occurring at the Capitol and then how the OMMA responds to that or does not to re respond to it. Um, and unfortunately, the OMMA with their regulations, their hands are really tied and dictated by statutory language created over at the legislature. So uh, we, we've really seen a, a challenge for the agency to be responsive to moves in the industry, developments uh, that are more appropriate for our regulations, but being hand-tied by what's going on over at the Capitol. And we are in basically the last week of session right now at the Oklahoma legislature. And uh, really, unfortunately, what we're seeing is the same thing we've seen in the last three years where our Senate in particular are very non-responsive to the needs of both our regulatory agency as well as the industry itself. And we're talking about some pretty basic functional issues uh, that most businesses would be, um, uh, we would expect our elected officials to have some response to. That's really interesting. And Mike, I'd love for you to weigh in as well. You bet. Thank you for having me here today. Um, sure. Our, uh, you know, there, there have been a lot of problems with rollout and the regulatory agency, it seems like they've taken some fairly tone deaf type of, of actions, uh, changing packaging restrictions on the same day the language rolls out, leaving uh, the industry with uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of units of legacy packaging that is immediately non-compliant. Uh, rolling out uh, with the aborted rollout of, of metric on the what seemingly should be the, the, the most uh, uh, robust month of the year and uh, really caused a, a down month in what, what should have been uh, the best month. And it, it, I think that's really because of a, a kind of a lack of stability within the agency. We've had four directors in two and a half years. Uh, it seems as, as though about the time a director becomes uh, knowledgeable, has some basic knowledge about the industry, they move on to another position within the health department. And so I think moving forward, stability is going to be a key for OMMA, the uh, regulatory body uh, uh, in MMJ in Oklahoma, and uh, dedicated enforcement personnel. The personnel they have inspecting today also inspect restaurants, hotels, and bars. Well, then they also inspect some MMJ properties when they have time. And I think moving forward, it's going to be key to have those personnel dedicated to only MMJ um, uh, duties. Now, so there's a, probably the longest serving senator in the state of Oklahoma who one time uh, had a bill and, and said it was probably the worst bill in the state of Oklahoma in the history and his long and storied career and, and spent 15 minutes excoriating the bill until someone turned around and said, Senator, uh, you're a co-author on the bill. Uh, to which he immediately pivoted and said, well, now that I've told you all the bad things about the bill, I'm going to tell you the good things about it. So now I'm going to tell you some of the good things about uh, uh, the, the OMMA and, and things moving forward. It, it looks like the OMMA is probably going to be moved from the health department 
to the ABLE Commission, which is the alcohol beverage law enforcement agency in the state. And I think that will really put some teeth into enforcement in Oklahoma and create that stability that I believe we need in a regulatory body. And so while things are, are probably haven't been the best, uh, you know, I think the regulatory agency is, has done a great job with what they have. Things are, are progressing for the better and moving forward and we're excited to see it. That's great. And I think, Mike, you made a very good point. And these agencies really need to have someone who has some experience in the industry. And at this point, you know, adult use has been legal and, and the, you know, the medical side has been legal for a long time in a lot of states. There are those people. So I think, you know, for us, we need to make sure that the people who are in those regulatory agencies have an idea of what's going on. So I think we're going to actually see that more and more as a lot of people from the space are going to maybe be moving into those, you know, types of roles. So I think that's a huge point, you know, just going forward as well. So let's kind of go back a little bit to metric because I'd love to touch upon that. You know, metric is a blessing and a curse um, for a lot of reasons. So Travis, let's chat about that a little bit. I'd love to. Um, so, I mean, I, I can address, you know, the ways in which it's, it's a blessing first, uh, and then I can address some of the ways that it's been a curse. Absolutely. Um, it's been a blessing in so much as, you know, I, I believe that it will bring um, a little bit more enforcement to, or it should bring a little bit more enforcement to regs. I see Brandy nodding her head. Um, you know, this is important for uh, any market to reach maturity and uh, to get to the point where you've got a thriving ecosystem industry-wide. Now, that doesn't necessarily need metric per se, but to have some sort of consistency uh, across the board is important because there are a lot of um, software providers that do varying amounts of different things that uh, they probably shouldn't. And if there are a number of them that are reporting to the state, um, you know, the, the rules that people have to abide by, I mean, there are just a lot of reasons that people could fall flat and offset accountability elsewhere. Um, it's difficult for enforcement because the state has to have a number of different points of contact and so forth. Um, Again, this doesn't necessarily mean metrics specifically has to be the only provider, but um, I do think that it's good to have some sort of consistent uh, process that you know, everyone is held to the same standards across the board. The curse has definitely been the method in which the implementation has taken place, the stability of the platform, uh, the economics uh, that have been kind of uh, forced onto the operators. We have, uh, you know, the largest integrator footprint in Oklahoma uh, by a pretty wide margin. And, you know, we have uh, well over a thousand licensees in Oklahoma on Growflow today. And what we hear all the time is that our margins are already so low, it doesn't make sense why I would need to pay um, for one-time use RFID plant tags when the same information could be gotten in, in a much more inexpensive way. And in our opinion, you know, our, our uh, North Star metric at Growflow is we want to put more money in the bank accounts of our customers. Like Growflow grows your bottom line, period, end of story. So it is painful to see that this particular item is something that has to exist uh, in such a low margin industry already. Um, but the benefits going back to it is if we get some consistency on what folks can and can't do, everyone is held to those standards, the quality goes up, uh, and, and everything goes up across the board. Um, so I think that like those two things uh, are important to weigh. I think, unfortunately, metric has not shown um, a high, like, we have not gotten a high amount of confidence uh, in you know, their ability to have stability as a platform. So if folks are dealing directly with metric or they're dealing with metrics API, they will have frequent outages. Uh, it's just a reality of, of what they've got today, uh, which is unfortunate, but um, it is the reality and they've got the, the great relationships with the various states. So it is what it is. 
Um, thankfully, we we and a few others have been able to put in some some items in place that can prevent this, but or or prevent the operators from feeling that pain. Uh, but it is a reality that those outages can bring business to a screeching halt some days and for prolonged periods of time, uh, which is also a curse. And lastly, I think um, there's just a profound lack of support. At the end of the day, the state is metrics customer. It's not the it's not the the operator. It's not the business owner. Um, they're they're essentially a a government sponsored monopoly in a lot of ways. Um, so they have to keep the state happy, and and the, the operators have to use them. So there isn't really any support if something goes wrong, if something's confusing. And I think that's also a massive problem in an industry where the barriers are so low to get in, which is a good thing in our opinion. Um, there there needs to be a lot more education. There needs to be a lot more support. There needs to be a lot more, um, you know, a lot lower of a response time, you know, so we can get people the, the help they need if they decide to, to just go with just metric. You made some great points. And, you know, I think even the last thing that you said, you know, there's no assistance. There's no way for people to get those resources, you know, in the state. And I feel like operators often feel siloed um, just by nature of what, you know, we're doing in the industry because you're trying to grow grow business from the ground up. So I think, you know, just being able to have access to easy resources like that, it will make a chance or make a difference because we need to just partner on everything, even at the state level. So thank you for that, Travis. And Brandy, I would love to hear from you. So tell me a little bit from your perspective as a vertically integrated company. Um, so first of all, I am a supporter of metric and that not necessarily of metric, um, but of something that will help with enforcement of the rules and regulations in our state. Um, we have the thing we have in Oklahoma is a lot of people that have never run businesses before that have come in and they're like, Oh, this has been my dream. This is so great. It's legal. And they've put their entire life savings into starting a marijuana business, which is an incredible opportunity. And I'm grateful that our state has given that to us. Um, however, I agree with, with Travis and you, we need support. These people, some of them literally have just never run a business before. So to implement a program like metric, when you don't have any experience using anything like that, um, we need that support. Those people need the help um, to figure it out. It's been a pretty much a nightmare for us as um, we have a dispensary, a grow and a processing facility and preparing for metric was weeks of lots of hours and um, just, just a crazy amount of time we had to put in to prepare to implement metric. So when the state, and I was grateful on one hand, because as a grower, it was very hard for us to figure out how exactly to work metric into our grow without updated rules, um, without a uh, roadmap for, for now, how do we do this? When do we harvest? How long do we have to, um, to put our harvest details in? Things like that. They just weren't given to us. So on one hand, it was good that they put it off. But on the other hand, we spent a lot of time and money preparing for that. So um, it was a little frustrating for us. But I'm grateful that they're working on it and, and trying to figure out some better ways to go. But um, I will agree with Blake and Bud both. I think um, Oklahoma has done an incredible job with what they've done so far. We had our license within a few months um, of, of, two th of the 2018 legalization. Um, so they have done a great job on a lot of levels. I think the only place they're really lacking is simply enforcement. Um, we have a lot of rules that we have to go by and not very many businesses. Well, maybe there are more than I think, but um, I see a lot of marijuana businesses that do not take those rules. You know, they, they just don't care. Um, and they, some of them just don't know they exist. So um, enforcement has been a, a big issue for me and I will look forward to seeing much more of that. That's great. And you also made a good point, you know, as cultivators now with metric and everything, you have to be software professionals and inventory, you know, gurus as well. So it, it adds a whole nother kind of, you know, wrench into everything. But, but I'd love to circle back to you and just get your own comments on metric, if you don't mind sharing. 
Thank you. And I want to piggyback on Brandy's comments because uh, it's important to understand the perceived rollout of metric in Oklahoma. Um, this is consisted in the initial email notifying licensees at the end of very end of January uh, of the projected implementation timeline, uh, which they stated as April 30th being the formal implementation deadline for all licensees. During the course of those next three months, there were three total emails. That was the only communication that was received from licensees from the OMMA. And then the guidance from metric was just non-existent. Um, so there are several folks that are uh, participants in this town hall panel who, along with myself, have been communicating with our leadership at the Attorney General's office and the state legislature on trying to address this issue and just inform them that A, as industry, we totally support uh, seed to sale. We understand there needs to be more robust regulation and enforcement. However, that has to be consistent with our existing regulation. So here's a problem that uh, we really saw and it definitely expressed to the Attorney General's office that there is no codification of how metrics software requires us as licensees to input our data. So effectively what we have here is a case of the tail wagging the dog. And it's a concern for us because our regulatory and statutory program in Oklahoma is very unique. It's not a one size fits all uh, in the box solution like metric software is really developed towards. So we are concerned that uh, it does not reflect how our program has been set up. And I'm gonna give a very specific example here. I own a, a farm and I'm a grower and the way that metric wants you to report your harvesting protocols is to harvest each plant in whole, weigh that individual plant, wet weight, report that wet weight. Well, that doesn't actually reflect how we do harvest. That doesn't reflect how my guys in the field are taking down each plant and what we're harvesting from that plant. Uh, also in statute, the Oklahoma legislature has effectively excluded stalks, stems, roots, and fan leaves from the definition of waste. So in metrics reporting protocol, it requires you to report waste, including all of those parts of the plant. So we have a direct conflict between the way metric operates and the way our statutory and regulatory regime is in place. So uh, fortunately, the uh, Attorney General's office, the OMMA and legislative leadership put a pause until at least June 30th on uh, the implementation of metric. Uh, there is an existing lawsuit pending as well in Okmulgee County uh, on this matter. So we'll see how this unfolds. But ultimately, I think most of our panelists would agree that we all want to see some sort of program, whether it's metric or something else. We just want to make sure that it's consistent with business practices and that it really embraces the way that our industry is uniquely developing in Oklahoma. Thank you for adding that as well. So I would love to bring Pamela Taylor on screen to ask her question. So Pamela, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pamela Taylor, and I'm a business consultant uh, that features and specializes in diversity, equity, and inclusion here in the state of Illinois. And uh, two years ago, Illinois uh, became legal. Actually, last year, Illinois became legal in um, recreational cannabis, but had a very strong focus on social equity and restorative justice. And I'd really like to learn more from the panelists about the initiatives that are taking place in Oklahoma regarding social equity and restorative justice initiatives. Great. So Marco, I'd love for you to start off with this one. And thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Pamela, for the question. Yeah, I think the Oklahoma market has been uh, very interesting. I mean, it was really kind of uh, uh, pioneered as a, uh, a free market approach, right? Very low barriers to entry, um, you know, initial licensing cost of about 2,500. Uh, generally, the cost of real estate is a lot lower. Um, also, that type of approach has kind of created a little bit of barriers of entry for multi sales operators, right? We don't really see uh, big names such as Truly, uh, Green Thumb Industries, uh, operating in Oklahoma, and so really kind of create an environment where, uh, you know, individuals with a, a smaller amount of capital interested to get into the industry uh, can easily get into the industry. And and so from that perspective, you know, kind of the way the numbers shook out was that 
you know, I know on our end is a, is a CPA firm working with a lot of clients. And when we kind of compare Oklahoma versus uh, other states we're operating in, we definitely see a much more significant minority representation in Oklahoma owners. And I think it's been kind of just one of those um, kind of call it maybe uh, unintended consequences or not, just kind of the way really the things uh, worked out with that free market approach. And really, I think in a lot of ways uh, has benefited a lot of a lot of minorities to get into the industry in, in, in Oklahoma. Great. Thank you. And Wesley, I'd love for you to unmute yourself and weigh in on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. To uh, piggyback on what Marco was saying, the low cost barriers to entry into the market definitely has allowed for more uh, minorities or people from certain backgrounds to enter into the cannabis market when compared to states like California or anywhere on the East Coast where they have these massive licensing fees just to apply. So I do, when you talk diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think by happenstance, Oklahoma has hit the diversity and the inclusion on that. Um, whether that was the intent behind it or not, it is a diverse market when you look at all the cannabis operators in this market. Um, and I don't, I don't think this should be taken negatively. It's my opinion, and I do think it's true of Oklahoma and where we're at right now. But I think the piece when we're talking about the equity side of it, there has to be a conversation around it. It can't just be, let's you know, pat ourselves on the back because we have a diverse set or subset of operators in this market. Um, I think the biggest issue in that would be access to capital and capital is going to win out in this market. So when you look at other state programs that have had a conversation and put thought behind their social equity programs, you're going to find that they have added access to capital, easement on the real estate front, things that would typically be a barrier to entry to someone who has been put in a position from previous circumstances they're putting the footsteps or they're putting the foundation in place so they can not only just enter the market, but have a true equal chance of being successful in the market as well. And in my understanding, Oklahoma has not started that conversation. Um, legislatively, we take steps backwards, again, to mention other social equity programs around the country. A lot of those are driven behind prison reform Oklahoma doesn't even want to talk about prison reform, especially when it comes to cannabis users or cannabis carriers. So again, to kind of, you know, close out my comment on a positive note, diversity and inclusion, yes, in my personal opinion, that was due to a $2,500 licensing fee and anybody that had it could get into the market and go. So that would work anywhere. And again, to stay positive, that's where other states have struggled because they've made mandated 50%, 40%, 30%, whatever it is, has to go to a minority or a certain group. And that's just an instant lawsuit. Now everybody is on the sideline. But when we do talk social equity and we talk Oklahoma cannabis market, I'd like to talk about it and have intentional thoughts behind it, find out where people are struggling, find out why they're not going to be successful and put something in place that truly does include everyone. Just getting them into the game, in my personal opinion, is not enough. Ensuring their success and longevity in the game, again, in my opinion, is what the equity aspect is about. Absolutely. And that's, you made a great point because even with license in hand, it's not done. You know, you need the building, you need everything for build outs, you need a lot. So, that, you know, that's a huge discussion. And it's something that state by state needs to address, also the industry in general, um, and investors too. So, you know, I encourage the investors on this call to really look at those who are license holders and really need that capital to make the next step. Um, so thank you, Wesley. And Blake, is there anything you want to add on to that? Uh, yeah, happily. Um... I, I really appreciate a couple of the points that both Marco and Wesley made. Um, you know, I think uh, a, a theme that they, that they sort of both hit on is that whatever, to whatever extent Oklahoma has developed a relatively diverse um, market in terms of industry access, it's been largely inadvertent. Um, you know, Wesley used the phrase non-intentional. Um, 
And I think that may be right, but I'm a bit more pessimistic um, because I think we're starting to see significant attrition. We're starting to see real contraction in the market, especially um, amongst, you know, sort of one-off mom, pa type small businesses. And I think we're going to see that disproportionately affect um, our industry participants of color. You know, I uh, certainly think we could, we could, we could celebrate the fact that there are more at the initial stage entrants into the industry that come from different socioeconomic or cultural backgrounds. Um, but I think our sort of um, pride in the free market approach that we built here in Oklahoma in the long run may kind of run up against efforts at actual social equity, uh, which do require intentionality and which require intervention into the market that is, is inconsistent with that sort of libertarian free market model if you want to create long lasting and sustained change. And it would be really remiss, and I appreciate Wesley pointing this out, for us to talk about social equity and leave out the, um, the historical piece, the, the incarceration state that, uh, that we all live in. You know, we've talked about how Oklahoma has the most robust medical marijuana patient community per capita in the, in the country. We also live in the most, as a percentage of our population, the most incarcerated jurisdiction on the planet. Um, and while, um, while there may be some incidental diversity in the industry, it's also the case that by and large, the ownership class in the medical marijuana industry in Oklahoma, like most places, is, uh, is white. And, and it's also the case that our, our prisons and our jail cells are disproportionately populated by black, brown, and Native American people. And you know, I, I, I try to take an opportunity anytime I have a platform like this, and I appreciate the platform we've been provided, and I hope you'll indulge me this opportunity to point out that this it's not just an observation that the industry should be cognizant of. It's, an, it's a moral imperative that the industry has to take responsibility for. Um, there are generations of people and whole communities that have been devastated by decades and legacies of criminalization, prosecution, over-sentencing, and those legacies live on. If you are driving through Oklahoma, especially right now, as a person of color with out-of-state license plates, you're very likely to get pulled over. And you are very likely to have drug dogs on your car. And if you are not a non-Oklahoman who doesn't have a medical marijuana license, you're likely to sit in a rural jail cell for several days before you're able to see a judge. Um, and that, again, disproportionately affects communities of color and poor people. Um, and it's not just enough for us to recognize the basic injustice that we're all profiting off of economic activity that others as an historical matter have been prosecuted for. We have to recognize the relationship between those two things, the economic opportunity that we have been provided in this particular moment as of 2018 is made possible by decades of criminalization and prosecution, which once again disproportionately affected communities of color and poor people. And we wouldn't have the profit margins, however slim we bemoan them to be, that we do. We wouldn't have this particular very exciting moment in the history of the state's development, if not for the fact that so many people before us were treated quite differently and were punished. And many of those people are still in jail. Um, and, you know, to Wesley's point, there's not a lot of political momentum in this state uh, for real sustained calculated efforts at addressing that. Um, and the only real place that we've been able to win those kinds of reforms has been at the ballot box. And more often than not, our district attorney's counsel has worked as hard as it can to undermine the, the intention of the voters and the effort of the organizers. Um, and, you know, the, my, the last point I'll make, and I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about this because I think it's tremendously important. The last point that I'll make is that it's very discouraging to me and disappointing to me that when we've had proposals for real criminal justice reform tied to cannabis legalization that have been proposed and in some cases uh, made it onto um, a, a, a a, a, an initiative petition, we've seen resistance in the medical marijuana community to those efforts. And the medical marijuana community is too often, in this state at least, is too often concerned about protecting what it's built, protecting the business model that it relies on, um, than it is 
much more important matters. You know, the reason that I that I got into the cannabis industry in the first place is because it's it's really a metaphor for decarceration for me. Um, and it, so long as there are folks who are sitting in jail cells for possessing or selling the same product that that we're all profiting off of, um, I think our first priority has to be to redress that injustice, not protect our bottom line. Blake, that was great. I you just spoke for probably more people than you could even imagine. Um, that was so powerful. And, you know, my personal opinion is any state that takes one cent from this industry needs to have a hard look at that, you know, because really nobody should be in jail for it if your state is taking a penny. So thank you for being just open about that. Um, and, you know, Whoever's going to follow up after that is going to have quite a uh, quite some big shoes to fill. But Aaron, do you want to weigh in on this a little bit? Absolutely. I definitely don't want to have to follow that, Blake. But but thank you for that. Uh, it's very important and very timely. Um, Wesley, one of the things that uh, I wanted to to bring up and and to um, discuss the, the the opportunities with the licensure. Um, easy access to licensure uh, in the state of Oklahoma is that that is a great first step. Uh, it's great that the, the, the barrier to entry is low and, and that has created minority business owners um, uh, to have access to that license. But a big, big piece and a big component that you had mentioned is not just the license, but how do these, how do these minority business owners access capital financing uh, to fund uh, their businesses, uh, because it's great to have the license, but you have to be able to, to capitalize in order to run your business. And, you know, to your point of, of being positive, you know, it, it is it is uh, encouraging to see that there are groups uh, out there that are launching funds uh, and platforms for diversity financing. Uh, and, you know, I, I wanted to bring to light one specifically, Sweet 420 has, has recently launched um, uh, Sweet 420 Access, which is a new venture to create social equity and financing for, for the cannabis space. Uh, so it's it's definitely not the, the solution. It, it's a start, um, but having that access to capital and, and, and more funds like you know, Sweet 420 Access being created is only going to lend to minority businesses being able to actually grow their business. Thank you, Aaron. And Lisa, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. So I'm an attorney and I've been working in this area since 2015 on competitive medical marijuana applications in many states all over the country. And so as many of y'all are aware, these are very, very expensive endeavors. People pull together these powerful teams, millions of dollars goes into these applications. You have to have a, a facility that's like Fort Knox, very expensive. And so as you can imagine, certain groups are completely left out of this process. And also the criminal background um, disqualifier leaves out, you know, this other demographic that we're talking about. And it's very unfair. And um, Pamela started this off talking about the social justice measures that some states are trying to put into their statutes. And that's great, but they've been sometimes strained and clumsy and it's resulted in the whole program being hung up in litigation and then you know the, the intended beneficiaries aren't getting to benefit from it so we do definitely need as an entire country to come up with something that is truly going to benefit the intended beneficiaries well, you went off. Yeah, I was like, we wait. don't end up, you know, in this situation. So, and and then you know that gets applied to Oklahoma. But I do want to point out on a positive note, um, based on my experience, the things that are in the Oklahoma law that have directly benefited um, you know, BIPOC people, and in in the statute, um, as has been pointed out. Um, the low barrier to entry for the application fee only being $2,500, not having to have, you don't have to identify on your um, application some Fort Knox facility. You just have to identify where it is, not any kind of building. So you don't have to have this enormous access to capital. And um, the, a very important part too is this: there's not this huge disqualifier. There's a criminal background check, but 
I think it only goes back a couple of years. You just have to attest that you're not currently incarcerated. It is easier to grow hemp anywhere in the country. I mean, it's easier to get a um, to grow marijuana in Oklahoma than it is to grow hemp anywhere in the country because hemp has a 10 year felony ban. And in most of the states, I mean, you're just automatically disqualified. So that has been huge. And the main thing that I really wanna point out to everybody that's my perspective in working in this for six years and many, many of these well-heeled teens, as I've said, in every instance for six years, all of these teens have been all white. Since I've been working, representing folks, investing into Oklahoma, operators in Oklahoma, this is the first time that I've had a bunch of Black clients, and I still do, and I continue to represent Black clients in Oklahoma, and I'm so excited that I do, and how come I've never represented any Black people before, and I think that's because there's greater opportunity in Oklahoma, so that. I think, you know, they're doing something right, even though it's not intentional. And I hope that there are more intentional acts in the legislature and that everybody, you know, gets together as has been stated on this webinar. And we do make it intentional. Thank you, Lisa. And Pamela, I know you have a follow-up question, so I'd love to hear that. Sure. Well, one of the things that I noted in doing research about Oklahoma is that the cannabis sales revenue is about $800 million and the actual uh, tax uh, income is up 161%. As we talk about social equity initiatives and restorative justice, do you see an opportunity to, you know, put dollars back into the communities that have been greatly affected by the war on drugs with all of the tax revenues. Here in the state of Illinois, 25% of the cannabis sales actually goes back to census tract communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs. Is that an opportunity for Oklahoma? Bud, I'd love for you to talk about this if that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. And really, I just want to piggyback on Blake's incredible testimony uh, discussing the social equity issue, because one of the things that he pointed out is critically important to understand about Oklahoma in that the entire cannabis program has been driven by a signature initiative process. It's been approved by a vote of the people, uh, whereas our legislature and our governor have been uh, not only opponents to cannabis, but real uh, hindrances to any real development, especially in the arena of social justice and social equity. Um, there's a 7% excise tax um, that is paid at the retail point that goes into basically funding the cannabis regulatory program. And according to statute, it's supposed to go towards whatever is left over, over 75% to public education and 25% to drug and alcohol treatment. Now, how much has actually gone to either of those in the three years of this program? I would say zero. I think most of it has actually gone into the General Revenue Fund and then the OMMA through the State Department of Health has been able to request uh, some form of appropriation of that. So I don't think we're seeing any money going in that direction. Do I think there's any appetite at our legislature to direct such initiative? No, absolutely not. Um, we're dealing with a, a controversy right now. The governor just signed legislation that bans the teaching of critical race theory in all public and private schools in Oklahoma. So. Uh, if that is an indicator of the appetite in Oklahoma to mandate through legislation such an initiative, I think the chances of that are incredibly poor. And, and here's a point for me to plug what I think has been a real problem in Oklahoma. Because all of our initiatives and really the pressure to change these or retain the positive features of our program have been driven by the public, by either organizing or industries uh, organizations, um, I, I would just be totally remiss by not saying how, <clears throat> how low of participation there is in the advocacy arena here in Oklahoma. I mean, our organization, we have roughly 500 members, but there's almost 10,000 licensees in Oklahoma. So where is everybody else? Why aren't they coming to the table and participating in these advocacy efforts? Because the only way that an initiative like a social justice reform is going to occur is if all of the industry folks actually get behind it and substantively contribute to it. Thank you, Bud. 
And Cambry, I'd actually like to loop you into this conversation too. So I know that in the past you did work on tribal cannabis in Oklahoma specifically, um, and you had published reports for it. So I'd love to kind of, you know, tap your brain about just all of that and how, you know, the tribes fit into that whole arena as well. Yeah, so um, yes, I, I researched tribal cannabis um, and I, I wrote I wrote a paper basically when I was in law school describing um, the successes and the failures across the nation, um, various tribes that tried to implement their own systems. And then um, kind of my hypothesis there was that the only way that this ever succeeded for tribes is if they did work directly with their states um, via a state compact. So um, federal intrusion basically was avoided so long as you were okay as a tribe working with your state. Um, so uh, applying that to Oklahoma, um, and I know Blake can speak a little bit to this as well, we've not really seen a huge effort, um, at least not, not as progressive as I would have hoped for tribes here to be able to legalize, um, have their own problem or their own programs. Currently, it's actually illegal to have cannabis on um, reservations in Oklahoma. Um, so businesses here, um, cannot be located on tribal lands. Tribal members cannot have medical marijuana and then take it back to the reservations with them. Um, and all of this has been further complicated by a recent Supreme Court decision, um, McGirt, which basically rendered, for the most part, all of Tulsa tribal land. Um, so there's so many complications right now. And um, the exciting thing, I think, in the cannabis industry is obviously that things change daily. Um, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis changes. Um, it's dynamic. But the downside to that is obviously the confusion, the ambiguity. Um, it's very difficult to know where I can actually have, you know, cannabis on me. If I go to a dispensary with my license and then drive, you know, on the Indian Turnpike to go home, is that illegal? Um, and, and you know, that's that's a huge problem right now across the board, not just for tribal um, specific regulations, but just regulations in general. Um, they're very difficult for the average person to sit down and read and actually understand and comprehend. Right. And as a lawyer, if you're confused, I mean, just imagine the general public. So thank you for weighing in on that. So this is our last question for the group. Um, and so how competitive is the Oklahoma market with its wide open approach? What has been the effects on the market price for cannabis? And Travis, I would love for you to start with this one. Sure thing. Uh, so you know, GrowFlow does get transaction data across the board. Um, we see everything that passes through the system. We've we've processed billions of dollars in transactions through GrowFlow. Uh, we're one of the largest in, in the industry in any state, but especially in Oklahoma. And what we've seen in Oklahoma because of uh, the kind of um, free market approach so far, the plants have become far more commoditized. Um, there is always going to be a race to the bottom when there is that sort of approach taken. Uh, so margins will become increasingly thin. Because of this, we see a high amount of smaller, uh, you know, one location, smaller boutique uh, types of operations that go out of business uh, pretty frequently, especially when there's any sort of confusion or some sort of um, just, just a weird situation, for example, the ice storm that rolled through uh, that caused a bit of a delay for you know, several weeks in many cases for, for many of the operators in that state. Um, even the, the metric deadline and the uncertainty that was surrounding it, um, the fact that the thin, my, the thin margins exist, if there's any disruption in normal courses of business, it becomes very, very difficult for operators to remain in business and pay their employees and keep their heads above water if they don't have additional income sources uh, outside of their core business. So it, it will continue to be uh, a commoditized, uh, thin margin business you know, for as long as that free market approach is in place. It's not necessarily to say that it shouldn't be, um, but that's just the reality that we've, we've seen. Great. Thank you. And Cambry, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Yeah, sorry, I can mute. Um, yes. So, I mean, I think that despite the fact that, you know, when, when 788 passed, obviously operators from different states did sort of um, trickle in 
if you will. Um, and they brought their experience with them. But one thing that is night and day between our climate here and a place like Oregon, which is actually where I'm at right now, um, is the moisture and the heat. So mold is something that, you know, in the state of Oklahoma, even if you've got 10 years of growing experience in the state of Oregon, coming to Oklahoma, you're battling climate and environmental hurdles that you've not really seen before. Um, so that that I think um, has led to a lot of people at least initially losing harvests, um, which has obviously kept the, the price of the people who are succeeding um, pretty stable. Uh, in addition to that, one thing that, that annoys me on a daily basis is our testing requirements. Um, so Oklahoma in general, I think of it as an agricultural state. Um, and this is just another form of an agricultural commodity. Um, so we don't have a canopy requirement. A lot of people here grow in mass quantities, um, yet our testing requirements, if you read them, you would think this in no way, shape or form does it actually match what we're doing here. Um, every, every harvest you have to uh, do a 10 pound harvest batch, um, which just doesn't make sense for somebody like Bud on his farm um, to pull down you know, an acre of outdoor and then have to test every 10 pounds of what he pulled down, despite the fact that it was all grown in the same conditions and, um, you know, trimmed at the same time, harvested at the same time. So um, I, I think legislatively that was, you know, I'm sure a win for the testing companies, but um, things like that, that don't necessarily fit our program well, I think have contributed to keeping the price um, pretty stable, but uh, not necessarily the margins, you know, it's expensive to grow here. It's expensive to outfit your buildings with AC and HVAC and, and the kind of things that you would need to, to withstand an Oklahoma summer. Thank you for that. And Mike, how about your thoughts on this? Certainly. Thank you. Um, yeah, Oklahomans have a pioneering spirit. So uh, back in 18, we passed 788, which I think we all agree is probably the most open uh, MMJ uh, program in the country. And uh, we've, we've all talked about the low barriers to entry and what, what that caused was the market to develop very rapidly into a hyper competitive market space. And, uh, you know, it's sort of been a mixed bag. Uh, the, a lot of MSOs have decided to uh, resources to other areas. And uh, uh, our personal experience, we were one of the first entrants into the market. Uh, so it's probably a, a little bit of an outlier to perhaps most uh, licensees experience, but we've seen an 85% drop in wholesale prices since from our first sale until our last sale today. And what that means to licensees is that you have to be relentless. I mean, absolutely ruthless in controlling cost. Uh, you have to have a, an ability to scale, which means access to capital, which in a hyper competitive market is uh, perhaps a little bit tougher to come by than than some other uh, market spaces. So we've seen the effects of that. Today, we have fewer licenses than we had one year ago today and a small amount, four or 500. But what we will see, I believe, is a an ever increasing uh, 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 rapidity of, of that of that draw over time, and we've entered the shakeout period. It's already started, and companies are are beginning to shake out as we speak. And there will be far far fewer licenses licensees one year from today than than there is currently. And what we do know that if, if companies can compete, if they can control cost, if they can scale, if they do have access to capital and they have the management ability to come out the other side of the shakeout, the companies in Oklahoma are going to be far better positioned than many of those even around the country uh, to expand not only in this market, but in other markets around the country as well. Thanks, Mike. And Brandy, let's hear from you about this. So um, again, I'm proud of our state. I'm proud that just virtually anybody can really enter into this industry in Oklahoma. Um, I'm passionate about it and I think it's incredible. However, um, this kind of goes back to enforcement. Uh, we have so many licenses out there. And um, as Mike said, they are we're entering the shakeout 
period it's happening however However, at the moment, we have a lot of those shakeouts that are, that know they're going to go, that are just doing as much as they possibly can and selling their products as low as they possibly can to get as much out of this industry as they possibly can before um, before they're shaken out. Um, OMMA has started doing um, inspections and and actually. Um, are venturing out into our businesses at this point, which is incredible and exciting for those of us that are doing things um, the right way. But um, there's just so much, the prices of wholesale commercial cannabis are all over the board. Um, you have some businesses that are sticking with their guns and they won't go below a certain price. And then you have tons and tons of smaller guys that um, are just blowing as much um, wholesale marijuana out as they possibly can at the lowest price possible. And what's also happening is we're seeing a lot of cannabis that is not necessarily medicinal cannabis on the market. Um, people are buying it at super low prices and selling it. And, um, and we really just need some better enforcement. We need OMMA to really step up. And I was super glad to hear um, that the that the OMMA is going to be moved to the ABLE um, Commission. Um, that's an incredible step for us. I'm really excited about that. Um, we really do need dedicated individuals to do these inspections. Um, we need to ensure that what we're putting on the market for our patients is medicinal quality cannabis um, and not something that's that's been fluffed and and thrown through testing and part of it's probably okay some of it's not but but we're seeing prices just all over the board and um in cambry or it's is it Cambry that said um yeah um so Cambry had said well we're seeing some stable prices but I feel like um, on my end, as I buy wholesale cannabis every day that we are not seeing stable prices. I can buy a pound today for $1,000 from someone, and then someone can come in tomorrow and offer me that same quality for $2,500. Um, I mean, they're really kind of all over the board right now, and I think that's really a lot due just to the current condition of the market. People not sure if they're going to make it, metric, yay one day, nay the next day. Um, it's just been kind of a crazy up and down roller coaster for us. And, and as a business, it's pretty hard to keep up with. Thanks, Brandy. And Marco, let's hear a couple of thoughts from you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, and I think uh, Oklahoma has been very interesting. It's also kind of interesting to see kind of how that competition has developed across different verticals, right? I think kind of what we've seen is that the retail space um, and uh, extraction production uh, space were really the ones where we kind of started seeing contraction the first. And you've kind of seen it kind of both, both ways in terms of, you know, on one hand, the volumes are decreasing. Uh, on the other hand, the pricing is decreasing. So kind of both in terms of uh, dollars and in percentage uh, wise, you're kind of seeing that, that decrease. And, and kind of conceptually, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, those are kind of really the verticals where it was a lot easier to enter with, you know, obviously to get a, a retail location going in Oklahoma, that's going to be a lot cheaper. You don't need necessarily as much capital as you do need for cultivation. Um, I think with cultivation, also another thing we've kind of seen is that as people kind of entered the market, uh, you know, they would have uh, a couple of those harvests that didn't necessarily work out for them. Uh, you know, and by that point, they might have exhausted their capital. So really for the longest time, uh, we've kind of seen an undersupply of that flower. And when I say flower, I mean kind of the quality flower, right? You would see... Uh, you know, as, as Brandon was saying, there was a, a lot of flour out there, um, a lot of different qualities and price points, uh, but not necessarily, you know, a, a good supply of a very, uh, you know, quality flour. And so I think the groups that were really able to execute on, on that part and, and bring that good flour to the marketplace, uh, they've shown be winning. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot, a lot of groups out there that are able to demand uh, a price point of, let's say, $2,000 a pound. Whereas it's going to cost you, let's say, you know, five hundred to six hundred dollars a pound to produce, and so that there's been a lot of margin there. Uh, but I think strongly over time we're going to see a decrease in margin there as well. I think it's just kind of inevitable. Um, and I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing a lot more investment pouring into the space, uh, especially focusing on cultivation. We kind of hear stories about bigger growth uh, going up in um, uh, up in Oklahoma, and I think now a lot of operators are kind of in a 
you know, tough spot, right? Kind of what was the best way to go? Uh, you know, as Mike pointed out, I think controlling the cost is going to be very, very important. And I think there's probably two philosophies there. You know, one is uh, kind of stay focused on what you do and what you kind of do best and, and kind of try to achieve economies of scale via increasing volumes, right? Try to service a, 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 a bigger market, get more efficient, uh, you know, see if you can switch your cost structure from variable to fixed so that as you do scale, the fixed costs are remaining the same, but your unit cost. Uh, is decreasing. Uh, and then I think the other philosophy that you also tend to see is uh, people kind of going back to vertical integration. So if you're a cultivator uh, and, you know, you're operating now and you have a good margin, that's going to decrease over time. Hey, does it make sense to me to now start jumping into the retail space? Um, and so I think we're definitely going to see a lot more consolidation, a lot more M&A activity as, as that kind of space is consolidating and, and really the, the volumes for businesses, the profit margins, everything kind of starts more stabilizing and normalizing. Thank you, Marco. So we are actually at the top of the hour. So that went by very quickly. I'm sure we could chat about this a lot more, but I really want to thank everyone on the panel today, um, also our question askers um, and our audience. So just as a reminder, you'll see a, a survey pop up shortly, and we would love to have your thoughts on today's program and just let us know about important topics to you. And also please visit arcviewaccess.com and Arcview social media for all the latest activities and events at Arcview. And then I'm also going to chat about our upcoming programs in a second, but right after I wrap up, we're gonna have a 30 minute breakout session. Uh, Nicole will drop that Zoom link into the chat. If you wanna join us, we'll just further continue this conversation. And then in terms of upcoming programs, we have for our Women's Inclusion Network, we have a mentorship workshop on May 17th at 2 p.m. Pacific, and it is titled Lessons Learned from 15,000 Pitches, and it will be led by Angela Lee of 36 Angels. And then additionally, on May 20th at 1 p.m. Pacific, we have ArcView and the Cannabis Capital Group present the perceptions and realities of applying for a cannabis license. On May 27th at 1 p.m. Pacific, we have our next ArcView Access, which is going to be centered around creating a more inclusive cannabis industry. And that is a very, very important topic that we should all tune into. So again, thank you for joining today and we will see you at our next program. Thanks, bye.